Good morning, Congress. It's us again, the people, seeing something, and yep, saying something. This time, the message is delivered specifically to all of us out here who don't know just yet what is really going on and why you in Congress don't want us to know. But in the interest of fair play, we share the message with you too. We're coming for you, each and every single one of you, when next you have the audacity to attempt to lie to us, cover your sorry butts, and convince us to vote for you. Some of you may be able to fool some of the people some of the time, but you will never fool any of the people all of the time. And your time is up. The following article was sent to me via email this morning, and thank you, Keith, for sending it. Now, I agree with him that every American needs to make his or her own choices and perform his or her, her own actions in regard to the BS fakery known as Obamacare. But none should make any decision until reading this article very carefully or listening to it over and over again. Since part of the plan to bring this nation down was and is the complete dummying down of the populace and heavy indoctrination instead of education in our schools, too many of us cannot read, will not read, or simply do not have the time to read because they are working two or three jobs just to feed themselves. So for those who prefer audio, I'll read the article. And then I'll send it out in text, far and wide. You should all certainly do what you want, but Keith and I highly suggest you do not sign up for Obamacare until you read or listen to this carefully. Chief Justice Roberts carefully worded his ruling and left out any requirement to participate for 95% of Americans. One Stone, Two Powers How Chief Justice Roberts Saved America So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. 1 Samuel 17, 50. Many people are very angry at Chief Justice John Roberts for his ruling that Obamacare is constitutional as a tax. They are outraged at what they see as his validation of the complete usurpation of constitutional protections and terrified that America has been effectively destroyed. Some of them are even talking revolution and asking each other in person and in print, what are you prepared to do? Well, this analysis of the Roberts ruling asks the same thing, but in a different context. What are you prepared to do? Are you, for example, prepared to read? Are you prepared to learn? Are you prepared to entertain the concept that you might be wrong about Roberts, about what he actually ruled, about what he actually meant, about what he actually did, and why the rest of the court would not stand with him? Because if you aren't, then don't bother reading or listening any further. Beware. This analysis pops bu bubbles hard. Here's a taste of what I mean. You know all the yowling and screaming about how Roberts changed a penalty into a tax? In his ruling, Roberts quoted Obamacare itself at Title 26, Section 5000A, G1, which reads, The penalty provided by this section shall be assessed and collected in the same manner as an assessable penalty under subchapter B of chapter 68, period. 
Then Roberts did this amazing, totally judicial thing that no one else can possibly do except someone with his vast power at their fingertips. He actually looked up the law that Obamacare quoted, and when he did, he found that subchapter B of chapter 68, specifically at section 6671A, says, The penalties and liabilities provided by this subchapter shall be assessed and collected in the same manner as taxes. Any reference to this title to tax imposed by this title shall be deemed also to refer to the penalties and liabilities provided by this subchapter. Then, after reading these actual laws cited by Obamacare itself, Roberts made this blockbuster observation. The requirement to pay is found in the inter Internal Revenue Code and enforced by the IRS, which, as we previously explained, must assess and collect it in the same manner as taxes. Let's see. Roberts said the penalty must be assessed and collected in the same manner as taxes after reading that Obama care itself invokes Section 6671A, which literally and specifically states the penalty must be assessed and collected in the same manner as taxes. Wow, that's a radical ruling. And what exactly is Section 6671A? It's a part of the Internal Revenue Code that was there before Obamacare was ever created. All Obamacare did was point to it and say, use that. So why weren't Americans enraged about how Section 6671A equates the treatment of penalties as taxes before Obamacare? People can disagree with him if they want, but how the hell can anyone say Roberts is legislating from the bench when he simply repeats back pre-existing tax law that Obamacare references for itself? Of course, the answer to that question is simple. No one actually looked up the laws before they decided that their country had been destroyed. Yet they're ready to fight a revolution over it. A revolution for what? To make new laws that they still won't read. If you want to get angry, get angry about how the other eight justices didn't point out this simple fact about penalties already being treated as taxes. After that, all that's what the judges are supposed to do, right? Point out what the law is, rather than what anyone wants it to be, right? And isn't that exactly what Chief Justice did here? Maybe that's why he's Chief Justice. He gets to read the actual laws. Maybe all the other justices have to listen to the media to find out how they should rule. So you're warned. This analysis is not for the squeamish. But if you really want to learn what Roberts did and why he did it and what the Obamacare tax laws actually mean as opposed to what you thought they meant, read on or listen on. And you can start by understanding this. Chief Justice Roberts limited the constitutionality of Obamacare to only those statutorily defined persons upon whom the income tax is imposed. 95% of the American population are not those statutorily defined persons. Therefore, Obamacare does not apply to 95% of the American population. Don't believe me? Then, like I said, read on. Point number one. Imposed means enforced. Part one. Taxes, whether voluntary or not, are subject to enforcement. If a tax can't be enforced, it's not a tax. That's why the income tax law, Title 26, Chapter 1, Section 1, starts out with, there is hereby imposed on the taxable income of every individual, unquote. And the Obamacare law, Title 26, Section 5000A, B1, starts out with, 
there is hereby imposed on the taxpayer who has an who is an applicable individual a penalty unquote. notice the mutual use of the word imposed it means enforced by the government point number two Obamacare is part of the income tax laws Obamacare at title 26 section 5000 a b2 states any penalty imposed by this section shall be included with the taxpayer's return under Chapter 1, unquote. Chapter 1 of Title 26, the Internal Revenue Code, is where the income tax is imposed. Title 26 is also where Obamacare is found. So when Obamacare penalties, which enable it to be imposed and therefore enforced, are specified within Obamacare itself to be part of the income tax return, then they are also thereby making those penalties subject to the income tax enforcement laws of Title 26. Point number three. Obamacare is written to deceive. In his ruling, Roberts observed that Obamacare specified that its penalty, quote, shall be assessed and collected in the same manner as an assessable penalty under subchapter B of chapter 68, unquote which in turn specifies that those penalties, quote, shall be assessed and collected in the same manner as taxes, unquote. Then he notes that the authority for those acts are found in Section 6201, Assessment Authority, Section 6301, Collection Authority, unquote, which are the same authorities used for assessing and collecting income taxes. Then Robert says something very curious. He says, quote, that interpretation is consistent with the remainder of Section 5000 AG, which instructs the secretary on the tools he may use to collect the penalty. See Section 5000 AG 2A, barring criminal prosecutions. Section 5000 AG 2B, prohibiting the secretary from using notices of lien and levies, unquote. Look what stands out. What Roberts is saying are, quote, tools that may be used to collect the penalty, unquote, are actually, if you look at his parenthetical descriptions, denials of the tools necessary to collect the penalty. The first refers to barring criminal prosecutions, and the second refers to prohibiting the secretary from using notices of liens and levies. So, how are they tools that may be used to collect the penalty? And besides, just how is the Obamacare tax penalty going to be collected if both criminal prosecutions and liens and levies cannot be used to go get it? Roberts is drawing our attention to these statutes. Let's look at them. Title 26, Section 5000 AG2 says, Notwithstanding any other provision of law, a. In the case of any failure by a taxpayer to timely pay any penalty imposed by this section, such taxpayer shall not be subject to any criminal prosecution or penalty with respect to such failure. B. The Secretary shall not parenthesis I, file notice of lien with respect to any property of a taxpayer by reason of any failure to pay the penalty imposed by this section or, in parentheses II, levy on any such property with respect to such failure. Section A has to do with barring criminal prosecutions. Sounds nice, but what does it apply to? A failure to timely pay a penalty. Guess what? Failure to timely pay a penalty is not a criminal act. Usually, it invokes further penalties and interest. Only if you fail to pay altogether could the situation reach criminal status. And even then, it would have to be willful. Otherwise, the penalties and interest would just continue to pile up. Willful failure to pay is not failure to timely pay. So since the only criminal charge that Section 5000 AG2A protects a taxpayer from doesn't exist, the entire statute is a fraud. It's meant to make people think Obamacare is harmless.
and that deliberately putting off paying its penalty won't make anyone subject to criminal charges, but this isn't true. How about Section B? Well, a levy is a seizure of property. For that to happen, a lien has to be filed first, specifically what property is to be seized, and that due process has been followed after the lien has been filed. But before the levy is made upon the property, a notice of lien is sent to the taxpayer who owns the property and government intends to seize through levy to let them know that the lien has been filed against them. Now what does B.I. say? That a notice of lien shall not be filed. Well, notices of lien aren't filed, except as copies of the mailing that was made to the taxpayer. Liens are filed. That's the functional act, not notices of lien. Filing a notice of lien is not the same thing as filing a lien, because it does not legally enable a levy. It's literally just a notice that an actual lien has been filed. And it's supposed to be mailed, not filed. So when BI forbids it to be filed, well, good, because it's not supposed to be anyway. Yet this was obviously written to make you think it's talking about actual liens when it says notices of lien, when it's not. How about B? I, I, where it is specified that no levy on any such property shall be made, well, what such property? None other than the property in B.I., of course, that was specified in the notice of lien. But wait a second. You can't legally levy property just from a notice of lien anyway. You need a real lien to levy property. So this section, once again, is saying that something illegal will not be done by the government, specifically that no property will be seized with just a notice of lien to back up the levy. Hey, thanks a lot. So what are we left with here? What did Roberts draw our attention to when he specified laws in Obamacare that he said are tools to collect the penalty when they seem to be tools to prevent the collection of the penalty? He did nothing less than to indicate that these prevention tools are no such thing, that they block nothing, and that the only actual tools that are in indicated enable the full collection powers of Title 26 laws to be used, i.e. it's a fully functional Death Star, and not just those directed by Subchapter 8 of Chapter 68, but also criminal penalties and lien and levy powers, even worse. Both of these were cited by Obamacare not only to mislead the public, but also to establish a judicially noticeable reference to legitimize their usage against the public. Roberts deliberately drew attention to this, and in doing so, he effectively said, Watch out! Read carefully. This ruling is dealing with a law that was written to deceive. You have to be very careful in your reading of both it and my ruling if you want to understand what everything means." Unquote. Then, concerning enforcement, he showed that nothing in Obamacare blocks the usage of Subchapter B of Chapter 68, criminal or lien and levy powers against taxpayers to collect Obamacare penalties, and most importantly, Obamacare is written to deceive. Point number four. Person has different legal definitions for different purposes. So what else is Obamacare being so deceptive about? Well, when Chief Justice Roberts referenced Obamacare's use of subchapter B of chapter 68, he cited a statute from within that subchapter to support his interpretation of its usage. Specifically, he cited Section 6671A. If you look up 6671A, you'll find that it does indeed support Robert's interpretation. You'll also find underneath it Section 6671B, right where the Chief Justice wanted you to find it. Title 26, Chapter 68, Subchapter B, Section 6671B states, 
The term person, as used in this subchapter, includes an officer or employee of a corporation or a member or employee of a partnership who as such officer, employee, or member is under a duty to perform the act in respect of which the violation occurs. That's a very important definition of person. But before we get into that subject, remember those two other enforcement tools that were supposedly banned from use, but actually were not, discussed above in point number three. The first was criminal enforcement. The second was lien and levy powers. Criminal enforcement is found in Chapter 75 of Title 26. Thus, the definition of person for the purposes of criminal enforcement is found in that chapter. Specifically, it is found in Title 26, Chapter 75, Section 7343, and it reads, The term person, as used in this chapter, includes an officer or employee of a corporation or a member or employee of a partnership who as such officer, employee, or member is under a duty to perform the act in respect of which the violation occurs. Finally, lien and levy powers are found in the chapters 63 and 64, specified by Chief Justice Roberts in his ruling, where he references them as the Assessment Section 6201A and Collection Section 6301 chapters, respectively. Now, liens are only useful to enable levies, so definitions for levy powers also reference lien powers. And in the levy chapter 64, at section 6332F, we find the following definition of person. The term person, as used in subsection A, includes an officer or employee of a corporation or a member or employee of a partnership who as such officer, employee, or member is under a duty to surrender the property or rights to property or to discharge the obligation. Take a moment at this point to compare the three definitions of person cited from references from Robert's ruling listed above that are found in three different enforcement sections of Title 26. They are identical, yet if you look up the general Title 26 definition of person in Section 7701A1, you will find the term person shall be construed to mean and include an individual, a trust, estate, partnership, association, company, or corporation. Notice that generally speaking, for the entirety of Title 26, the term person also means the term individual. That's why when the income tax laws and Obamacare laws address individuals and persons, they have identical meanings. But compare the general definition of person in section 7701A1 above says it's just an individual, a trust, a state, partnership, association, company, or corporation. That's it. No fine print. But the definition of person for enforcement purposes in the above cited sections 6671B, 7343, and 6332F are way, way, way more narrow. To be that person, you have to be, one, an officer or employee of a listed type of corporation, and two, under a duty to perform an act, and three, in respect of said act, a violation occurs. That's a lot more specific than just being an individual, a trust, a state, partnership, association, company, or corporation. So what does this difference in the definitions of the term person mean? Well, it means that the definition of person the government can punish for tax violations is not the same definition of person that is used in the rest of Title 26. More specifically, it means that the only persons the government can impose tax violation enforcements against are officers or employees of a corporation who have a duty to act in some way regarding tax laws on behalf of their corporation and who violate those tax laws 
on behalf of the corporation they officially represent. Do you represent a corporation in an official capacity to the government on behalf of that corporation's tax obligations? If not, then you are not a sections 6671B, 7343, and 6332F person who can be liable for violating the tax enforcement laws. And by direct reference through Obamacare itself, the enforcement laws that the government would use to go after persons it claims are violating Obamacare taxes or penalties or fines are also found in Section 6671B, 7343, and 6332F. So if you are not that definition of person, which is repeated three different times in Title 26, to make absolutely clear exactly who it's talking about, then you are not liable for any other taxes which make use of the enforcement provisions linked to that definition, including income tax or Obamacare. And in his ruling, Chief Justice Roberts deliberately cited a law which, if you actually look it up, is right next to the enforcement definition of person for Chapter 68, Subchapter B, and he also indicated that further enforcement definitions should be sought for the fully applicable criminal and lien and levy chapters of Title 26, all of which turned out to be identical enforcement definitions for the term person. That extraordinary sequence of events is no accident. It is a communication. Point number five, taxpayers are individuals are persons. So if the definition of person is so important, why do both the income tax laws and Obamacare laws refer to individuals? To confuse you, of course. And in any event, they both refer to taxpayers. Think of it this way. Persons or individuals may be subject to the enforcement of a particular tax, depending on a lot of things. Taxpayers, however, are persons or individuals who are subject to the enforcement of a particular tax. That's why Title 26, Section 7701A states, the term taxpayer means any person subject to any internal revenue tax. So it's clear that both individuals and persons may be subject to tax, depending on what definitions of those terms apply to them. If they're liable, then they are referred to as taxpayers. That's why both the income tax statutes and the Obamacare statutes make so much use of the term taxpayers. When they are talking about someone who might be subject to the tax, then they use the terms person or individual. But when they're talking about someone who absolutely is subject to the tax, then they use the term taxpayer. Point six, imposed means enforced. Part two. Both the income tax and Obamacare start out by saying a tax is imposed, not a tax is made, or a tax exists, or just a tax. And imposed means enforced. If it can't be enforced, it can't be imposed. So if it can't be enforced against your definition of person, it can't be imposed on you. Even, and especially, if you fit the general definition of person or individual, but not the enforcement definition of person. And if it can't be imposed on you, you can't be a taxpayer for it. And if you're not a taxpayer for it, it doesn't apply to you. Point number seven. News flash. The Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court knows all of this. But if he knows it, then why didn't he say it? Well, he did say it. Specifically, Roberts wrote, the federal government does not have the power to order people to buy health insurance. Section 5000A would therefore be unconstitutional if read as a command. The federal government does have the power to impose a tax on those without health insurance. Section 5000A is therefore constitutional because it can reasonably be read as a tax. Did you catch it? This is the paragraph that drives everyone crazy. This is the paragraph that makes everyone scream that Roberts is crazy. 
but apply what has been explained above to what Roberts wrote. He's talking about what the federal government has the power to do, and has, and as has been explained, you have to ask yourself, do what to whom? He says the power to order people to buy. Then he says the power to impose a tax on those. He's differentiating. People are not the same as those. Order people. The government does not have the power to order a free people. Impose tax on those. The government does have the power to impose on those because those are taxpayers. Taxpayers are literally, by triple definition, imposed persons subject to enforcement via the detailed descriptions provided in sections 6671B, 7343, and 6332F of Title 26. Specifically, one, an officer or employee of a listed type of corporation, and two, under a duty to perform an act, and three, in respect of said act, a violation occurs. And regarding those persons, and only those persons, Chief Justice Roberts ruled that Obamacare is constitutional. The federal government does not have the power to impose a tax on those without health insurance. However, he also specifically ruled that against the people, as in we the people, Obamacare is not constitutional. The federal government does not have the power to order people to buy health insurance. Roberts specifically protected the constitutional freedom of the American people right in front of their eyes, according to the actual meaning of the actual tax laws. After ruling against any other constitutional clause that could serve to confuse the tax issues, and that is why no other justice would support him, because in doing so, he isolated and exposed the secret of limited tax liability. Point number eight, the two powers. If you've come this far and didn't know this material beforehand, you might be in a bit of a shock at this point. Basically, the reason that Obamacare doesn't apply to 95% of Americans is because it can only be enforced against people responsible for running corporations, not normal people simply working and living on their own personal behalf. And more, those limitations on the enforcement laws don't come out of Obamacare. Rather, they're part of the income tax laws that have been there all along, and that Obamacare has attached itself to, in order to make use of them. Can this really be possible? It would mean that there are two separate enforcement powers held by the federal government, one for corporation persons and one for non-corporate, regular human being type natural persons, and that a giant scam has taken place by the government using legally defined terms such as person and individual and taxpayer in order to confuse these identities and especially to hide the two different powers of government. Well, let's look at Chief Justice Roberts again and see what he said about this subject. In his ruling, Roberts wrote, This case concerns two powers that the Constitution does grant the federal government, but which must be read carefully to avoid creating a general federal authority akin to the police power." Unquote. Now that's a hell of a thing to say, isn't it? This case concerns two powers. If you disregard the analysis pre presented above, then ask yourself, what two powers? After all, isn't that why the country has been ripping itself to shreds over Robert's ruling? Because it's only taking into account a single power, that of the federal government? You might say, well, there's the powers of the Commerce Clause and the Necessary and Proper Clause that Roberts threw out when he kept the taxing power in. But that's three powers total, not two. So what's the difference between them? How do you turn three powers into two? And for that matter, why should there be multiple powers in the first place? Don't we have only one government? No, we don't. We have two governments, in fact. Two completely separate governments under one constitution. 
The first government is the original one. It deals with human beings acting as human beings and nothing else. That government has to deal with a position derived from those human beings. And those human beings are acknowledged as possessing God-given natural rights that existed before the government was created and which cannot be removed by that government because it simply does not have the authority. The second government, however, is exactly the opposite of the first one. The second government creates controls and runs corporations. The very word incorporate means give body to or bring into existence. And because that government creates corporations, it owns those corporations completely, creates, uh, uh, sorry, because of the fact that it is their creator. Thus, legally, corporations are slaves to the government that created them by definition. They are created, live in obedience to, and die at the command of that government, including paying taxes to that government. And the rules that that government can make for those corporations are literally unlimited because those corporations have no rights. They only have privileges that are granted to them by their creator government, privileges which can be changed or terminated at any time, solely at the pleasure of that government. Functionally, those are the two governments which comprise the two main federal jurisdictional powers of our one constitutional republic, and thus they are the two powers to which Roberts is referring, and he acknowledges them both as constitutionally legitimate. But he also warns that it is extremely dangerous to mix them up. In fact, he points out that if you mix them up, you can end up with what he calls a general federal authority akin to the police power. But isn't that exactly what everyone is afraid Roberts has actually done with his ruling? Yet here is specifically warning everyone against making that interpretation of his ruling and teaching that the way to avoid that terrible mistake is to read carefully. So that's what this analysis is, a very, very careful reading. It is not my interpretation of Roberts. It is my careful reading of what Roberts actually said, per his specific instructions. Two governmental powers exist. Roberts said so, and warned against confusing them. For the Chief Justice said that if we mix them up, we will create by our very ignorance, a general federal authority akin to the police power. So what does that mean? It means enabling the federal government through Obamacare to start treating we the people of, of inalienable human rights like wholly owned government privileged corporations for everything. That is the definition of slavery, people my interjection there. Point number nine, bait and switch and presumption. But wait a second. I imagine you say again, what about forcing everyone to pay income tax already? If Obamacare doesn't apply to 95% of Americans because it's imposed by corporate income tax enforcement laws, then how the hell does the government get away with applying those same corporate income tax enforcement laws to non-corporate, regular human people, persons, for the income tax? Answer. You volunteer to be treated as a corporation. Remember in his rulings that Robert said that, without a careful reading, you can create a general federal authority akin to the police power concerning Obamacare. Well, concerning the income tax, most Americans have not made a careful reading of the tax laws, and therefore have created a specific federal authority akin to the police power concerning the subject of income taxes. You see, as free human beings, we have the right to make contracts, and there is such a thing as a presumed contract. 
What the government has done is argued to the courts, and the courts have agreed, that the government is not responsible for people's legal ignorance, and that if they act in such a way as to functionally volunteer to be treated as a corporation, then the government gets to treat them like a corporation. Even worse, courts have agreed that neither they nor other government officials have to tell you that you're being treated as a corporation under the interpretation that you don't need to be told since you volunteered in the first place. And then, to top it off, the government has created rules to make it extremely difficult, if not impossible, for you not to be treated like a corporation anymore by presuming that until you have proven you're not a corporation, they get to pound down on you just as if you were a corporation that was faking being a human being. As a result, you can actually can be convicted for fraud and go to jail for demanding you not be treated as if you were a corporation. That's the way it is. So the technical answer is no. 95% of Americans don't have to pay the income tax because its enforcement mechanisms specify that only corporations or people responsible for corporations are subject to income tax enforcement. The practical answer, however, is that without a lot of money and legal representation, the government will use the presumption that you are a corporation against you to seize your money and property and throw you in jail long before you can get through all the court hearings necessary for them to admit that you're a non-corporate human being type person. Or they will simply show you that that's what they're going to do to you unless you sign a document agreeing that you are in fact, a corporation, and agree that you've been a very, very bad corporation and that you deserve to pay all sorts of fines in order to stay out of jail. That's the way it is. So do not think. You can use the information in this analysis, even by quoting Chief Justice John Roberts of the United States Supreme Court, to stop paying income taxes. It won't work. The IRS will simply stomp you into oblivion. Because legally, they get to treat you under the presumption that you are a corporation. And they don't have to acknowledge any presumed corporations that try to claim they are not corporations. In fact, the technical legal name for that particular argument is frivolous. That's right. According to tax laws, interpretations and rulings pointing out that you are a human being who does not fit the specifications of the actual income tax enforcement laws is frivolous. Not funny frivolous, but rather go to jail frivolous. Read carefully, you're warned. Point number 10, generalization, a bridge too far. Contrary to what most people think, judges can't just go rule on something if they think it's wrong. They have to wait for an appropriate case to come to them, and sometimes it never does. Also, cases themselves have all sorts of issues and parts to them. Sometimes a case will seem to be about one thing, but it's actually about another. So for the purposes of what it seems to be about, it's useless. And if political operatives have decided that certain types of cases will be ruled against by their interests by certain judges, every effort will be made by those operatives to keep those cases out of the courts. Thus, a judge can wait a whole career and never rule on what he or she wants to rule on. The opposite is also true. Sometimes a case shows up and a judge realizes this is it, now or never. Another opportunity may never come or come too late to matter, so they act. That, I believe, is what Chief Justice Roberts has done with his Obamacare ruling. If he waited longer to make this ruling, Obamacare would be in another form and perhaps not so amenable to exposure for what it really is, or such a vast bureaucracy will have been formed by the time he got to rule on it that enormous damage to the country would have been done in the meantime. Or he simply might not have gotten to be the swing vote and would have been outvoted no matter what his position was. So he chose this, and he chose now. But what did he actually do? Simply put, he raised the alarm about something that goes far, far beyond Obamacare. In fact, it goes straight to the heart of why everyone is so upset. 
Roberts not only drew attention to the fact that by simply positioning anything they want as a tax, the government can force anyone to do anything at any time. He certified that concept as constitutional. And by doing that, he made sure the vulnerability of the country to totally legal tyranny would not go away. For even if Obamacare was repealed, his ruling would still stand. And Congress could just try again with something else. But why would Roberts do such a thing? After all, he actually warned against the creation of a general federal authority akin to police power. And he also said elsewhere in his ruling, our respect for Congress's policy judgments thus can never extend so far as to disavow restraints on federal power that the Constitution carefully constructed. Yet after saying these things, he then went and enabled them. Except he didn't. Because he pointed out, subtly, but clearly, for those who follow his hints as I have here, that these powers Congress is trying to use against the people do not, in fact, apply to them, but only to corporations. But the man is a federal judge, the top federal judge. Do you think even for a moment Roberts isn't fully aware of what the IRS legally does to people who try to use Roberts' own arguments against them? Of course he does. That's why he wrote the argument. Because now he wrote this argument, not you. And that matters. Because by definition, the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court is not frivolous. Even by the interpretations of the IRS. You see, Roberts jammed the machine. And scared the shit out of the entire federal government by doing it. That's why no other justice would join him. He terrified them, and he did it because it was the only way he could find to halt the unstoppable expansion of a process that was originally promised by Congress to be limited only to the income tax, but technically could be applied to anything. What was that process? The ability of the federal government to presume that natural human person Americans had volunteered to be treated as corporations under the law. The ability of the federal government to do this without telling them, and that such a presumption had been made against them. The ability of the federal government to use this presumption to deny Americans their inalienable constitutional rights by replacing them with government-controlled corporate privileges. And finally, the ability of the federal government to not tell Americans how to get out of that presumption without being harmed by trying to do so. When Obamacare came up as a tax law, Roberts and all the justices knew what this meant. It meant Congress had gone back on their promise to presume this terrible corporate tax power upon people only for the purpose of the income tax and use it for everything. Because Obamacare was the generalization of this principle that opened the door to its infinite use. As long as the only application of these tax laws were for income taxes, that single application stood as a kind of protection. But with the second application, the principle became generalized, and with that, the door swung open. But the real problem was that it was legal. Yet Roberts did not make it legal. It was made legal long before Roberts was even born. People have a constitutional right to contract. Contracts can be presumed by behavior. Ignorance of the law is not an excuse. It's all there. But in its application to tax laws, and now Obamacare, and with that, literally everything else, it has become diabolical. So what was Roberts to do? Throw it out. If he did that, it would come back. Congress is obviously licking its chops over expanding this principle of empowerment through tax enforcement. Obamacare, or something like it, or something else, would come back again and again and again, and each time it would be technically constitutional. So Roberts decided to take a stand, like John Hancock signing his name big enough on the Declaration of Independence to make sure the king saw it. Chief Justice Roberts ensured with the signing of his Obamacare ruling that unless everyone works together, no one is ever going home to freedom again. 
because the only way out of this problem is for Americans to know about it, understand it, and craft a constitutional protection against it. Not against corporations, but against people being treated as corporations and losing their rights through presumption. Remember Pelosi gloating that you'd have to pass Obamacare to see what was in it? She was telling you the truth about the government's use of presumption. The government presumes that you voluntarily surrendered your humanity for corporate status and then passes bills without telling you what's in them because you have no right to know what your corporate masters are doing until they want to tell you. Even then, they don't have to tell you. Pelosi didn't say she'd explain it, just that you could read it if it was passed. That's what happens if you fight the IRS, too. They're allowed to presume the corporate laws apply to you, and that you therefore have to pay the tax before you can challenge the tax in court. But then, if you pay and fight, the government doesn't have to tell you you're being treated as a volunteer corporation. Instead, they rule that your claims of humanity are frivolous because you're obeying corporate laws and standing in a corporate administrative court. This secret presumption has been repeatedly ruled as constitutional. You just don't know about it. So you can see why those who would convert the entirety of the Constitution into tax laws are drunk on the mechanism of presumption. That's why Pelosi replied when asked if Obamacare was constitutional, Are you serious? Are you serious? Look at her reply legally. She mocked the question as frivolous, because in doing so she limited her response to only incorporated persons. And remember, she was saying this as Speaker of the House of Representatives. In other words, she wasn't without authority when she said it. She specifically invoked the power of secret presumption by using contempt in order to hide behind its legal protections. Government employees use this indemnification technique all the time because the people don't know it's a legal statement. Before Obamacare, secret presumption meant income tax. Now it means people forced to face death panels and perform abortions against their religious beliefs when they don't actually have to. That's why secret presumption is the monumental problem Roberts has chosen to expose with his courageous ruling. And he did it now because our country is poised on, poised on the edge of a precipice. Right now. Compared to the absolute catastrophe of generalizing the secret taxing authority presumption all the hell out of the Obamacare is merely one example, with an infinite number of the same kinds of tax laws right behind it, waiting only for Congress to vote. But Roberts also showed the solution to the problem when he wrote, The framers created a federal government of limited powers and assigned to this court the duty of enforcing those limits. But the court does not express any opinion on the wisdom of the Affordable Care Act under the Constitution, that judgment is reserved to the people. Only the people can put a constitutional stop to the government's currently legal use of the secret presumption of corporate status against human beings. Roberts can't do that himself. But in a single, astonishing ruling, Chief Justice Roberts has warned the American people of what is being done to them, how it is being done, and the imminent danger of its expansion of use. What the American people will now do about this problem remains to be seen. One thing is sure, though. The more people who know about it, the better. Peaceful change can only come from knowledge. So pass the word. So is Justice Roberts a traitor, or is he a real American hero? I say, it all depends on whether or not we the people pay attention to what he has done and act accordingly. It seems to me that it is abundantly clear that now, more than ever before in the history of this country, it is imperative that we do not comply. Do as you wish, of course, but be prepared to suffer the consequences of the actions 
you have been manipulated into taking in order to justify the consequences. Many of you out there know who Chaplain Lindsay Williams is and have probably heard his interviews over the past few years, but his latest one involves information about just exactly what the Affordable Care Act really is and just exactly why it was shoved down our throats. At the very least, you'd better listen to what he has to say about those smart meters and get busy getting rid of or neutralizing yours. Yes, America, for the sake of all humanity, we must see something and say something, loud and annoyingly repetitive, because we are the answer. <laughs>